Okay. Hello and welcome to NOAA's National Ocean Service Science Seminar Series. My name is Tracy Gill. Today and for all Tuesdays through May 28th, I am co-hosting a seminar series with Giami Shrepka, Director of the U.S. Carbon Cycle Science Program Office. And Giami will offer some info on the background for this series. But before she does, here are a few logistics and related information. The presenter today is fine with clarifying questions during the seminar. Feel free to type them into the chat box. If you are interested in getting a PDF copy or recording of today's presentation, we will list the website in the chat box where you can find them in a few days. Or you can contact me, tracy.gill at noah.gov or Giami Shretka, and she will post our emails in the chat box. And we'll be happy to send you a copy. If you are not on NOAA's weekly science seminar list, but you would like to be, please email me at tracy.gill at noah.gov and I will gladly add you to the list. Folks in the room, please sign in and silence your phones. And now I will hand it over to Giami Shretta. Giami? Thank you, Tracy. Hi, everyone. I am Giami Shretta, Director of the U.S. Carbon Cycle Science Program Office and co-host of this webinar series with Tracy Gill from NOAA. Today's seminar is the fifth in a three-month seminar series titled From Science to Solutions, the state of the carbon cycle, which is focused on communicating the second state of the carbon cycle report findings in relation to current and broader societal impacts and solutions. The recording of prior webinars are available on the YouTube channel of the US Carbon Cycle Science Program. All pertinent slides and details of the webinar series are available on the website carboncyclescience.us. This webinar series is sponsored by the U.S. Carbon Cycle Science Program in partnership with NOAA. For those who don't know about the U.S. Carbon Cycle Science Program, we are an interagency partnership led by the Carbon Cycle Interagency Working Group. We coordinate and facilitate federally funded carbon cycle research with the science community, and we provide leadership to the U.S. Global Change Research Program on carbon cycle science priorities. We are one of the longest running U.S. interagency working groups in global change research. The U.S. Carbon Cycle Science Program also led the development of the second state of the Carbon Cycle Report with a diverse team of over 200 U.S. and international experts. This decadal assessment underwent rigorous multi-draft peer review by the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, the public, and 13 federal agencies and departments before its release in late 2018. On behalf of my colleagues, I would like to express our deep gratitude to NOAA and particularly Tracy Gill, as well as all webinar speakers for making this 14-week webinar series possible. Today's seminar is titled All About Carbon, an overview of the state of the carbon cycle report. Our presenter is, is Dr. Melanie Mays from Oak Ridge National Lab. Dr. La Dr. Mays is one of the five science leads of the second state of the carbon cycle report. In that role, she took charge of multiple chapters, ensuring appropriate cross-chapter scientific consistency. Webinar series co-coordinator Tracy Gill from NOAA will now read our speaker, Dr. Hi, Dr. Melanie Mays is a senior staff scientist and team leader with the Environmental Sciences Division and the Climate Change Science Institute at Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee. Melanie holds joint faculty appointments with the departments of Biostems, Engineering, and Soil Science and Earth and Planetary Sciences at the University of Tennessee. She is interested in diverse research at the intersection of water, soils, minerals, solute chemistry, and biological cycling, and she designs experiments to build better models to represent natural processes. 
Her current research involves improving the representation of terrestrial carbon cycle processes in Earth system and process models, developing techniques to incorporate metagenomic information into nutrient cycling models, and investigating technologies to reduce mercury loading and methylmercury generation in surface and groundwater systems. Welcome, Melanie, and thanks so much for taking the time to present your work at the NOAA Science Seminar today. Take it away, Melanie. Thanks very much, Tracy and Gammy. I, I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to give this presentation. Everyone can hear me okay? I'm going to assume it's great, otherwise you would tell me. Um, yes. Again, so again, this is an overview to the State of the Carbon Cycle Report, which came out at the end of last year. And I want to a priori state that this says it's Melanie Mays, but in fact, I'm presenting research from over 200 authors and 13 federal agencies. So it's, this is definitely not just me. In fact, I'm simply compiling a lot of the things that are presented in the report. So, um, so this report is sponsored by the U.S. Global Change Research Program, which comes out of the 1990 Global Change Research Act. Um, and the goal of that is to develop and coordinate a comprehensive and integrated research program to assist the nation and the world to understand, assess, predict, and respond to human-induced and natural processes of global change. There are 13 federal agencies involved with the Global Change Research Program. And most recently, we presented, we published the Soccer 2 report, which is actually the second report. The first one was in 2007. And it is North American in scope. So we cover USA, Canada, and Mexico as well. In this presentation today, I'm also going to talk about the Climate Science Special Report, which is part of the National Climate Assessment. Um, and I'm going to use, I'm going to draw on the Climate Science Special Report to help fill in understanding of how that informs carbon and climate. And both of these reports, of course, contribute to the National Climate Assessment. And for those of you out there who might not want to look at 880 pages of Soccer 2 or 477 pages of the Climate Science Special Report, these reports are designed to have executive summaries, highlights, they have reports in brief, a lot of ways to where there are short and accessible summaries for the public and for the scientific community. These reports are both assessments. And so what that means is all of the authors surveyed existing peer-reviewed scientific literature um, there were specific standards that are established following the Information Quality Act. And the authors themselves make assessments or judgments on the quality of available information. And so authors in these reports will describe things according to confidence levels, for instance. Are we very confident in something? Or are we only, in a medium sense, confident in something? Additionally, Sometimes we will refer to different ratings of likelihood. So we might say something is very, very likely to happen. In other words, we think maybe nine out of ten times that, that this, is, this is correct, that this is the most likely thing to happen. On the other hand, sometimes we don't have the scientific basis that we would like uh, to be able to have a lot of confidence in something. So in that case, we may have to say, well, we have low confidence. Or we may say that this is unlikely to happen. Um, in addition, uh, the reports will use statistical uncertainties, so specific measures. And so a lot of times in this presentation today, you'll see where there are stars next to particular values. And so, for instance, a five-star statistical uncertainty means that we are 95% certain that the actual value is within 10% of what we quoted. And so on. And so if you see something with one star, for example, that means that the uncertainty is greater than 100%. And in an assessment like this, it's very important for the authors of the report to be able to say, you know, what the quality of information basis is. So that's why there are these different rating systems that are buried in the reports. 
These reports do not provide policy recommendations. This is in accordance with the Federal Advisory Committee Act of 1972. And so when we talk about things, what we're doing is we're drawing from examples of things that have happened and things that have been written on in the literature, but we're not providing specific recommendations. Um, the Soccer 2 structure and team, again, this is all under the U.S. Global Change Research Program, and the Carbon Cycle Science Interagency Working Group and the Soccer 2 Federal Steering Committee, these are all federal employees that oversaw the process. And there were federal liaisons for each chapter. Soccer 2 itself had 19 different chapters. And so I was one of the five science leads for the process, so it was composed of both federal and non-federal scientists. And then we helped work with all of the chapter leads and the chapter contributors. And these, these contributors were primarily from the United States, Canada, and Mexico. And in addition, uh, the editorial team at Oak Ridge National Lab helped compile the report and put it together. And so this figure comes from the FAO. This is a very simplified representation of what the carbon cycle is, which is effectively what the carbon cycle report does, only for North America. So in this case, what you can see is that combustion from industry and um, fossil fuel power plants contribute CO2 into the atmosphere. Trees, on the other hand, pull that CO2 out of the atmosphere. All of the components of trees and litter and plants and things that are living out here in the environment get deposited into the soil where it is decomposed by soil bacteria, which also releases CO2 into the atmosphere. Trees themselves, through their roots, also respire CO2 in the atmosphere. At the same time, soil in the land is, can uptake carbon. So all of that carbon that isn't decomposed will stay within the soil and ultimately, given the right conditions, could create fossil fuel. So this is a very simplified version of what the carbon cycle looks like. This next slide is a little more detailed. So this is, say, if you wanted to go into an ecosystem and you wanted to account for how much carbon is in any particular place, you can do this. So you can do the amount of carbon that is in the leaves of a tree, and you can account for how much is in trunks and branches and roots. You can go into the soil, and you can figure out how much carbon is in that soil organic mat. And then you can measure respiration. You can figure out how much carbon is being respired from the soil. You can measure how much carbon is being taken up by plants in terms of photosynthesis and respiration. And so this is effectively what the Soccer 2 report does, but for North America. And so this next slide is really, this is our core finding of Soccer 2, which is the North American carbon budget. And it's important here to point out that the first Soccer report was published in 2007. So it contained data up until about 2004 or 2005. Our report, it just came out in 2019, but of course it's actually been in preparation for about three or four years. And so the time frame over which we are um, summarizing is basically the decade since that first soccer one, so say 2004 to 2014 or something like that. Um, but so anyway, so this is basically the carbon Budget. And so this is what we did in this report, is to try to put numbers on all of these different ecosystem compartments. And so what you can see here is that the black arrows pointing downwards towards the land represent uptake. So in this case, there are two major places where carbon from the atmosphere is taken up by the ecosystems. And so one of them is over on the right. This is net carbon ecosystem uptake. And then the other one is over here on the left, and that is uptake by coastal waters. And then those red arrows right in the middle represent sources. So in the case of the big red arrow right in the middle of the figure, this represents fossil fuel emissions. This is the largest number on this diagram. It's 
1774 teragrams of carbon per year. That's over a million tons of carbon um, for each teragram. Okay, and so that arrow is very large and it shows that we are releasing more fossil fuel emissions than what the land or the coast is, is taken up. And so then ultimately what that leads to is the amount of carbon that's being contributed to the atmosphere. And so what that means is that and so that what that means is that the atmosphere is basically becoming a net sink for that carbon coming out of our ecosystems. Um, we also show harvested wood emissions. That's significant. And something very new um, to the Soccer 2 report is a focus quite a bit on net emissions from inland waters. So you can see that that is a net source of 247 teragrams of carbon per year. Um, in addition, we have also quantified some transfers into the coastal ocean and also out to the open ocean. And we also have quantified things like burial from inland waters and burial in coastal waters. And I do want to point out the star system here. So you can see that some of these we have a lot of certainty about. For example, fossil fuel emissions is something that we can measure with great certainty and we know it because of the isotope. Other things are a little harder. Burial, for example, is a harder thing. And so what you're looking at here is an overview diagram. But what the report also does in Chapter 2, in order to get to that place, is to very specifically look into ecosystems in order to build those overall budgets. So for example, this net ecosystem flux listed at 959. That's all of the land ecosystems. So Arctic and boreal ecosystems, forests, urban trees, agricultural soils, and so on. So we've accounted for all of these different parts. And again, within Soccer 2, there are chapters on coastal ocean, there are chapters on estuaries and tidal wetlands, there's a chapter on inland water, there's a chapter on forest and on Arctic and boreal, there's a chapter on grasslands and interior wetlands. So that's what each one of these chapters does is to provide the overall budget for their ecosystem that then contributes back to this overall budget. And so this is a really huge undertaking, actually, to put together all of these numbers to be able to get this carbon budget. So I'm really pleased with our authors to be able to accomplish this. And so, of course, in the process, um, We've been looking at carbon dioxide and methane, global trends. Now, I want to mention, I've said that Soccer 2 is a North American report, but we do have an overview chapter, chapter 1, in fact, that is based on global trends. But at the same time, some things like carbon dioxide and methane are globally represented. And so this actually comes out of Chapter 8. And what you can see is that in the blue line, we're looking at global CO2, and the red line is global methane. And the two dotted lines in the middle of the diagrams represent uh, Soccer 1 in 2007 and Soccer 2. Fossil fuel emission trends in North America have been very interesting, actually, since Soccer 1. And so, the black line at the top represents all of North America. The blue line right below it represents the U.S. And then the red and the green lines at the bottom of the figure represent Canada and Mexico. And so each of those lines corresponds to the axis on the left, which is annual fossil fuel emissions. On the right is an axis which is the proportion of global total, and that is the dotted line that goes across the middle of the figure. And so what you can see is that for the United States and for North America, emissions have actually decreased over the period of time in soccer too. And this is also accompanies basically a decrease in our contribution to the global total. 
And I see that some folks of you are asking some, some questions, and some of these are pretty specific questions I'm likely to wait um, to get to, and I'm sorry about that, but just feel free to put questions up as, as they come to you, and I can do, deal with those at the end. Some of them are easier to address in the middle of a presentation than others, so sorry about that. Um, so coming back to fossil fuel emission trends, um, and so this is also something that is very interesting. What we're looking at here in the main diagram is gross domestic product for the U.S., um, normalized to $1990, and energy CO2. And so what you can see is that GDP is continuing to increase while energy CO2 emissions are flat. And that is what Soccer 2 has documented. And this is also true for North America. Energy use is flattening and emissions are decreasing. Uh, this is not necessarily true for the globe, but it is definitely true for the North America and, and the U.S. And the reasons why have to do with a variety of things that have been happening. Um, transition from coal to natural gas has become very significant over the past decade. We've increased uses of renewables and alternative fuels. We are replacing aging infrastructure, including pipelines and power plants. And this picture that I show right here, this is local to us in Oak Ridge. And you can see the tall stack is the old stack. And the short stack is the new stack. It's the one that's operational now. And this change from these two stacks has happened in the last, I'd say, about 15 years. But in fact, it's been just recently decided that this plant is actually going to be retiring in 2023. So this is an example of why we are seeing changes in emissions. And there are other things that have been happening too. Um, increased efficiencies of buildings, increased transportation alternatives, more biofuels, more public transportation, more stringent cafe standards, that is car emission standards. Natural gas use, as I mentioned, has been increasing in the U.S. And this comes out of, I think, Chapter 3 of the Soccer 2 report. And so the blue line shows natural gas share of electricity generation. And the cyan line shows the share of primary energy. And so natural gas has become a lot more important in the decade over which Soccer 2 has covered. The same is true for renewables. You can see this, this color that I've highlighted right near the top, which is you can see more solar and wind and other kinds of energy resources, as well as an increasing share of natural gas and a decreasing share of coal and coal products. And in terms of emissions, we know that there are basically three choices. We want to decrease emissions. We can decrease our use. We can increase efficiencies. We can increase renewables. Soccer 2 report shows that we've actually done all of those things. There are other things that we could try to do. We need to decrease carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, carbon capture and storage, for example. Or negative emissions. That's technologies to remove previously emitted CO2. And the Climate Science Special Report spent quite a bit of effort to talk about where we are in terms of emissions and what that means for temperature increases and for how it's influencing our environment. So, for example, the bar chart in the lower left hand corner shows all of the red bars refer to more daily record highs. Whereas all of the blue bars mean more daily record lows. And what you can see is over the past couple of decades, we're seeing a lot more daily record highs than we are daily record lows. The figure in the upper right shows surface temperature changes. Notice that nearly everywhere is red. And so what this represents is the period from 1986 to 2016 or relative to the period from 1901 to 1960. 
And so when you look at it that way, what you can see is the last 30 years show a lot more temperature increases relative to 1901 to 1960. So there are important temperature increases that we are starting to see in our climate that is most likely related to fossil fuel emissions. Here's another example of this. It is getting hotter. The 10 hottest years globally, if you look at these, only go back to 1998. This is not completely up to date. 2018 is on this map somewhere. Um, but what you can see is that more of these hotter years have been more recent. And so, when we start thinking about what the future is going to look like, um, we have a variety of what are called representative concentration patterns. And these represent a range of possible emissions. These things are very, these scenarios are very, very widely used, for instance, in the IPCC. And we can basically use these to predict annual global carbon emissions based on what we think people are going to do in the future. It's very important to realize that these scenarios are not specifically key to exact activities by people, but more of a range of possible scenarios that could happen in the future. And so what you can see, of course, is that we're on the black line. This is the observed. And that this high scenario, the RCP 8.5, gives a very different carbon emissions trajectory, for example, compared to the RCP 2.6. And so you can also use modeling to project global temperatures as a result of this. And so, for example, here you can see that the RCP 8.5 generates very high future predictions for global temperatures, and RCP 2.6 presents a stabilization. And so one of the things is, why is this uncertain? Like, why don't we know what future temperatures are going to be? Because what we can do is we can break this down into basically three different parts. Atmospheric CO2, so how much carbon is going to go in the atmosphere. And you can also think about where that carbon is going to go and how much of it is going to go into the ocean. So what we're looking at here, actually, is a range of model predictions for uptake of atmospheric CO2. And so, but what you can see in this next figure, this shows land uptake. And you can see that the model scenarios for land uptake, actually, are highly spread apart. And so we have some scenarios that show a lot of land uptake happening into the future, and some scenarios that show uh, land becoming more of a source of carbon. And so all of these different model scenarios, <clears throat> and so all of these different model scenarios, is that better, Rob? I hear somebody saying something about um, my not speaking loud enough. Oh, good, thank you. Um, what the model scenarios are showing us is that there's a lot of variation depending on exactly what goes into that model. And so here's an example that comes out of the carbon cycle report. It talks about different, different kinds of uncertainty. So the ocean is on the left and the land is on the right. And you can see that for the land, a lot of that future uncertainty is model uncertainty. In other words, we're not really sure how to configure the model to be accurate. Whereas the one on the left, for the ocean future, is, it's really the problem with the scenarios. We're not sure what the scenarios are going to be. And so part of the reason why there is uncertainty in particular in the land has to do with Arctic and boreal ecosystems. So for example, here I'm drawing on a, a recent paper and what it shows is the center line across the middle is the dividing line between whether or not permafrost soils are expected to become a sink or whether or not they are expected to become a source. And what you can see is until about 2060 or 2070 or so, 
with a variety of degrees of warming that all of these permafrost soils are generally functioning as sinks overall. But when you get out to about 2080 or so, what you can see is that the more warming we have, the more likely that the permafrost soils are likely to become a source of carbon to the atmosphere. And we know that this is very important because northern latitudes store substantial amounts of soil carbon. And so what you're looking at here, this is looking at the globe from the Arctic, from basically at the North Pole. And the red values signify lots of soil carbon storage, and the blue values signify lower amounts of carbon storage in those, in those soils. And the carbon report also documents differences in Arctic surface air temperatures. And so again, this is basically the same view, where red refers to warming. So this is differences of mean annual surface temperatures from 2001 to 2015. And so you can see that on nearly everything visible here, there is some degree of warming. And right in the middle of the Arctic, there's a lot of it there. And so uh, there have been a number of studies that have been looking at permafrost temperatures over the last 60 years. And so the figure on the left shows a transect that goes from lower latitudes and discontinuous permafrost. This is in, in Alaska. And a on the higher part, just above the dotted line, this is an area of continuous permafrost as well. And so if you look at the figures on the, on the right, um, the ones at the top represent northern Alaska, and the figure on the bottom represents interior Alaska. And if you just look at those, what you can see is that temperature at 20 meters or 15 meters depth, either one, tends to be increasing over time. And so this is consistent with what we were just looking at and seeing those warmer surface temperatures in this Arctic region. So there's been very long-term monitoring of this. You, can, you may or may not be able to read this, but the one on top, I think, goes back to 1976, and the one on the bottom goes to 1980. This is a very long-term And in terms of projected carbon changes, um, this is what things look like by 2050. And so what you can see again is that same pattern of northern latitudes showing decreases of carbon per meter squared by 2050. There are some increases in carbon. Those are shown in sort of the blue and white. But overall, especially in northern latitudes, we're projecting that carbon is going to decrease by 2050. And this is also consistent with what the Climate Science Special Report shows in terms of sea ice extent. And so the, the figure on the top shows sea ice in 1984, and the one on the bottom shows sea ice in 2016. So you can see that the area looks much smaller. And then the figure on the right starts about 1980 and it goes to 2015. And what you can see here is that September sea ice extent continually decreases um, very significantly over this period of time. And so, again, this is consistent. And so what we're looking at is projected changes in N annual average temperature. And so up at the top, the top two figures show the mid 21st century. So the lower scenario, that's RCP 4.5, is on the left. And then the higher scenario is RCP 8.5, is on the right. And the ones on the bottom refer to the late 21st century. And what you can see is all of these show increases in warming. 
and that the increases in women were more significant with that 18.5 scenario. This is also consistent with what we are projecting for historical and projected global mean sea level rise. And so in this case, um, the figure on the top is showing global mean sea level, and then the one on the bottom is basically just simply blowing it up. And what you can see is that this is something that is starting to be visible on this kind of scale. And climate science special report also shows this here. And so what you can see is for Charleston, which is on the top, and for San Francisco, which is on the bottom, oh, those, the orange bars in there represent the data. And then the colors on the right represent predictions. And so you can see that the trend is there in blue. And so that is, this is basically minor tidal flooding, sort of nuisance flooding kind of thing. Um, but that it, but that you can project this outwards. In Soccer 2, we have um, presented some data on ocean chemistry. Because, of course, as the ocean takes up more CO2, as concentrations increase in the atmosphere, there's an equilibrium between the ocean and the atmosphere. And so what you can see are changes to ocean chemistry as a result of those atmospheric CO2 changes. And so, in particular, we present three different ocean monitoring stations, which are shown on this map. And this next figure shows, um, shows those different sites um, in the different colors. And so the figure on the upper left represents the partial pressure of CO2 in the atmosphere. The figure on the upper right shows CO2 in the water. And so what you can see is both the atmosphere and the water are showing increases in pressure of CO2. But that's also concomitant with changes to pH. So the lower left hand diagram, as you get more CO2 in the water, it becomes more acidic, and so pH drops. And so that is also a visible record. And again, this is a fairly long term record. It started in it's like the late 1980s. And it's continuing until now. So you can see that there are decreases in pH over time. And so in terms of um, in terms of surface pH and surface carbonate, what ultimate what this next diagram shows is the different RCPs and Arctic Southern Ocean and Tropics. The surface pH is shown on the top and the carbonate ion is shown on the bottom. And what is significant here is where the aragonate saturation and the calcite saturation, which are on the very bottom, when those start to cross the RCPs, what this ultimately could mean is we could get to the place in some places, especially higher latitudes, where um, Shellfish, for example, have trouble precipitating the carbonate shell uh, because of the pH of the, of the ocean. And so, in summary, um, about half of North America's fossil fuel emissions are entering the atmosphere. Um, and the land and coastal oceans continue to take up very significant amounts of carbon. Energy related carbon emissions in North America have decreased over the period of soccer too, due to things like fuel switching, increased efficiencies, uh, changes to renewables, more availability of renewable resources. And at least in North America, this has happened without a loss in GDP. Carbon dioxide and methane concentrations, however, continue to increase globally, with concomitant increases in temperature. The Arctic experiences greater temperature increases than low latitudes, and Soccer 2 in particular documents a significant potential for liberating soil carbon, which could compound the effects of fossil emissions. And the effects are already being felt, which is highlighted in the Climate Science Special Report. Things like record-breaking temperatures, 
Soccer 2 shows decreases in ocean pH. A special report shows increases in sea level and recent flooding. And so, Soccer 2 in particular, we were wondering about what the cost and benefits of this would be. And the thing is actually is that there are different ways to think about this, but that it's also very hard to predict. So, for example, the cumulative cost is for the U.S. to reduce emissions by 80% relative to 2005 levels. That's an amount considered to be in line with the 2 degrees C goal. Is about $1 to $4 trillion. That's in 2005 dollars. A different set of studies, however, this is in, is in 2015 U.S. dollars, shows the total cost for climate change damages across health, infrastructure, electricity, water resource, agriculture, and ecosystems in the U.S. is estimated at $170 to $206 billion. That's just, of course, in 2050. And it's hard to extrapolate between what these two different studies mean because you have to make a lot of assumptions. And so here are the final reports that we've summarized. Um, and, you know, besides increasing, decreasing fossil fuel use, there are other things that software to documents that, that make changes to the carbon cycle. Increasing afforestation, um, improved agricultural practices. Minimizing land use from forest and grasslands, um, trying to reduce methane emissions from livestock, reducing alteration of wetlands and co coastal ecosystems, minimizing food waste, minimizing the use of nitrogen fertilizer. So these are things that we can do to make small changes to atmospheric CO2 concentrations. And in conclusion, um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming online to listen. And I would like to thank Gammy and Tracy for having me. And in particular, I'd like to thank all of the authors of Soccer 2 and also the Climate Science Special Report that have put in so much work to make this data possible. So thanks. Thanks, Melanie. If you have questions, go ahead and type them into the chat. Questions. And Melanie, since my audio isn't great, I'm going to ask you to read the questions and then answer them. Questions? Thanks. No problem. Thanks. So I, see, I do see a question from Hayden Sloan about inland water emissions. Mechanism of uptake by coastal waters. So, what are the what are the mechanisms then of uptake of coastal waters and the mechanisms of inland water emissions? So, in terms of inland water emissions, the mechanism there is is really that carbon enters inland waters from the terrestrial land surface, and in the process of nutrient cycling and carbon cycling, so that is decomposition by heterotrophic organisms and cycling also with autotrophic organisms, is that inland water emissions account for significant amounts of CO2 release. <coughs> Uptake by coastal waters. Um, I think in general what we're mostly talking about here is very the carbon, because the carbon is going to come into um, going to come into coastal ecosystems through the river system and things like seagrasses and mangroves and other, other kinds of biota in coastal waters are very effective at trapping that sediment and when it traps the sediment it also traps the entrained organic materials that are there as well as their own primary production. So for example seagrasses themselves and mangroves, for example, are very productive about their, with their own primary production. It also gets entrapped in there. So I hope that answers that question. 
And I see that Rob Graff has asked a question about how offshoring of production of goods affect decrease in emissions per GDP. And he points out that we import a lot of embedded emissions, and that's absolutely true. Um, and I'm actually not sure. This is uh, this information comes out of Chapter Three in Sofa Two, and I am not sure I know uh, the answer to that question. Whether whether or not that's that's considered in the calculations I showed, and I'm sorry, but I'm just not sure. Let's see. Okay, seeing a question from Steve Conkle, who says, "Where is the greatest potential for long-term change in emissions? Fuel switching, increased efficiency, or increase in use of renewables? And how does this, in terms of magnitude, compare to afforestation and other other measures that I mentioned?" Um, I think the greatest potential is simply to decrease emissions. It's much more important never ever to put it in the atmosphere than it is to hope that you can take carbon out of the atmosphere by, by afforestation, for example. And I would say the orders of magnitude is probably a couple of orders of magnitude. Hello everyone, uh, Tracy's uh, line is experiencing problems. Any more questions? Any more questions? Thank you, man, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, man, and thank you, man. Thanks, everyone.